Welcome everyone to our Hydrogen sit-down. My name is Chris Steitz and I'm here with Andreas Schierenbeck and Alexander Vogt, two co-founders of German hydrogen company HH2E. Thank you very much for taking the time. Um, Alexander, just explain to us how, what, which role does hydrogen play in the, in the energy transition that everybody is talking about at the moment? It will play an enormous role on many fields, but, but the direction that we are coming from is enabling 100% energy transition based on renewables. And therefore, hydrogen is a great integrating technology for the volatile generation of renewable from solar and wind. Can you just explain what your company does exactly? We are developing projects um, and using technology that are a combination of storage, storage functionality and sector coupling. So in terms of hydrogen, we are using batteries and electrolyzers. So we can take the energy out of the grid when we have a surplus of it, when the sun is shining. I mean, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., we have a peak of solar generation, four hours a day. We're taking this energy, we are storing it so that we can secure a 24-7 supply of green hydrogen. Andreas, how did you join the company and what was the process? I think it was an interesting process. Uh, I met Alex actually as I was uh, my former role as the CEO of a big uh, utility and uh, I was at this time already believing in hydrogen because I was setting up a decarbonization story. So getting out of lignite, getting out of hard coal, going on gas as a bridge technology, investing into renewables and finally hydrogen. And it was actually before the big boom of hydrogen was starting. I found that a group of a couple of engineers were working on hydrogen projects and uh, I found from my flavor, they were too slow, so I looked for an outside challenger and so I met Alex. He said, look, I need some old coal uh, stations where we have a grid connection, where we have water, where we have infrastructure and we can produce hydrogen there. I said, great. I have a lot of these locations, so let's do something together. And we started the idea to form a joint venture. Then I left the company. You know, um, the life expectancy of pet projects of leaving CEOs is pretty slim. So they went out of that project. And then six months later, Alex told me, look, they are gone. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, I have a few things on my private list I have to, to do. Uh, one is sailing and crossing the Atlantic. And after that, I'm joining you. And that's how the whole thing started. Fantastic. Um, you talked about the, uh, that you basically joined before the, the hype started. Maybe can, um, Alexander, maybe you can elaborate a bit about what the hype is. The hype is, I think, driven by the fact that everybody knows um, that we have to change the way we produce our energy. Decarbonization is, meanwhile, it, it's not any longer a niche theme. It, the, I mean, it's the, the broad public has accepted that, and so you need also um, a big picture of the technology which provides us the way into the future. And, and I think this, therefore, green hydrogen is the ideal thing because it can replace so many things that we are normally connecting with oil and gas. You can fly planes with it, you can drive cars with it, you can enable industrial processes with it. So it, it is something where a lot of, from a lot of angles you can project a, a very good and, and decarbonized future on it. And that's true, but the whole story, and that's the truth, will spin out over a lifetime. So in the beginning, it's very much like it has been with solar. In the beginning, it's, it's a niche product. It has a high price. With a doubling of the market, the cost will come down. And sooner or later, all these dreams will come true. I'm 100% sure, but it will take a time. Nothing can happen without support in, in this technology. And, um, and Germany has basically come out uh, with a clear mandate to, to promote the technology and um, to subsidize the technology. Um, what is your view? Is, is enough being done by the German government to really get the, get the industry off the ground? I think it's a tricky question. Uh, first of all, we are in Europe, and Europe is slow in these things. If you look to the Americans, they have with the tax credits uh, and the Inflation Reaction Act a very simple, very easy tool, which is proven for years because this was the tax credit were not invented for hydrogen. It's there for, for a long time. So f they have definitely a kind of competitive advantage in that, kick-starting the industry. I think we don't have this kind, uh, the same kind of vehicle in Germany or in Europe. We are more bureaucratic processes. The IPSI projects, you know the story. You, you ask for money, you get support from the government, then you have to wait. Some companies waiting now for two years. You're not allowed to start because then you're losing that. So I think there needs to be done more. 
I think there are a few things which you could do, like uh, better credits uh, or easier access to credits, because what we're doing is a new technology. And all banks, they like old technology, which is hundreds of times proven with guaranteed interests, uh, no risk, uh, all these things, which we don't have here. So I think a little bit more support and financing these projects and guaranteeing offtake uh, would help definitely to speed up the process. Yes, we can do it faster in Germany if you want. Alexander, any thoughts? Yes, you know, I think the, the, the big mistake that the people in Europe are, are making is they are underestimating the amount of money which needs to be invested in the energy transition. I mean, it's a factor of 100 above what a state can subsidize. It's a factor of 100 above what banks can do with their balance as, as loans, as credit. So we need private capital. So we need, we need to, to come to a framework that is attracting global private capital to enable our energy transition. And I think we are on a slow way, but in a, in a positive direction, that also our government gets this. You talked about the U.S. briefly, um, and uh, you, you mentioned that you know, the IRA is basically providing a very sound um, framework for companies to, to, to do business there in terms of hydrogen. Um, are you currently only focused on, on Europe and Germany, or is this something that you are also um, considering um, looking, looking across the Atlantic? You know, from my point of view, Alex, you can add to that. I think we have started in Germany as a German company. Uh, we are focusing on Germany at the moment. I'm not excluding that we go later to other countries or other areas, but we would definitely need strong local partners. Uh, hydrogen is an energy business, and energy business is always political, and you have to know the network, you have to know the circumstances and the players, and we know Germany best, so that's why I think the, the niche is not a niche, it's a huge business potential, which is good enough for us, I would say. Alexander, one thing I wanted to hear from you is um, if you could just explain to us the link between renewables and what role hydrogen can play, because in Germany we have very ambitious targets for 2030, um, it's an 80% target um, um, of, of renewables in our electricity mix. Um, how can hydrogen help us get there um, as on, on this path? I explained a little bit how I came across the, the need for hydrogen to solve our problem. Um, in in 2007-8, we electrified islands, existing islands in the Atlantic Ocean and uh, in, in the Creek Sea. Um, and we did that with solar, wind, and batteries, solving the electrical problem. The systems are running perfect um, results, but if you do an optimal system design, you end up with what we call 40% excess energy. That's energy that could be produced by the wind turbine, that could be produced by the solar model module, but you have to curtail it simply because the, the, the system is not able to take it. And for, for this amount of energy, um, hydrogen is the, the, the ideal um, way um, to transform the energy into, that you can store, that you, you can use in other applications. And so hydrogen and energy transition is a perfect match. This, I think this has to be understood. And if you look to the United States, where in the moment more solar systems are in the planning phase, that then are installed worldwide in the moment. I mean, the, the fact that the IRA has is completely underestimated, but that's also the reason why Bill Gates is saying that bringing together the, tech, the te functionality of a battery with an electrolyzer is the holy grail of energy transition. U United States, they have understood that, they are quick. In, in Germany, this is still on the go. And now to your question, are we focused on Germany back? We are focused on Germany because in the moment the market size doesn't matter. You have to get up technical supply, technology, technology integration into place. And therefore Germany is a real good country to do that. Once the, the, the technology is working and, and we have lined up um, also the supply chain for the technology, other markets will follow on its own. Let me add to that maybe because where we are coming from is the decarbonization. And for that, electrification is the, f the first thing. A lot of processes you can electrify with renewable uh, green electrons, all good and fine. But there is a big chunk of industrial processes which cannot be electrified. We are talking about gr green heat, high temperatures. We are talking about molecules you need for, for production of kerosene, for instance. You need hydrogen as a molecule. So this goes hand in hand. For an energy transformation, 
you need green molecules and green electrons. And actually this uh, volatility is even uh, good for that because shaving the peaks is the perfect time to produce hydrogen. So I think it's not possible to decarbonize uh, our society just with green electrons. You need hydrogen for that. And by the way, it's an excellent storage mechanism and it's a known technology. Sorry, uh, hydrogen is not new. Actually, it's the third time in 30 years that we are trying it. Uh, this time, I think we will make it. But the combination of both things is very powerful. Let's stick with Germany. Um, we've talked a lot about Germany. Germany is where you, you know, where basically the core of your business is. Maybe you can run us through the projects that you're currently working on and where you are. Yeah, at the moment we, we, are, we went public with two projects, one in Lubmin, one in Tierbach, where we have uh, PIDs, where we want to FIDs it this year. So that means that we want to start building. Um, both are built in phases. So we are starting with the electrical network connection of 100 megawatts and we are putting electrolyzers behind that in the range of 50 to maybe 100 megawatts. And if that is standing and we are selling more and more hydrogen, we are just able to expand these locations up to one gigawatt or maybe two gigawatt per site. So we have a goal of in 2030 to achieve at least four gigawatts. Uh, we have locations for that secured, so that's, that's not a problem. I think we have enough renewable energy already, and in the way forward in Germany, I think there will be abundance of electrical energy available, and that's where we are standing. So when can we expect those final investment decisions on those two projects that you talked about? I mean, these are two decisions, um, but we are quite sure that we will have the first final investment decision before the fourth quarter starts in this year. So, I mean, we're also looking on you know, where hydrogen can be applied. And I mean, the question would be, are you just looking at hydrogen or are you looking at the derivatives um, of hydrogen as well? Because that is in itself also a part of the value chain. Well, we are supplying green heat, by the way, as well, and green hydrogen, only the molecules. But of course, uh, the green molecules are prerequisite for a lot of other products. If you talk about e-fuels, if you talk about SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, uh, hydrogen is a base for that. Yes, you need sustainable CO2 for that to build the molecules, but there's a huge market for that, especially in the avionics where SAF is demanded and by law and you, you have to mix it. Uh, there's a great demand and we're looking into these projects as well. And if you're doing that, you can do e-fuels as well and actually, to be very honest, hydrogen is a very interesting molecule, but it's pretty hard to transport if you don't have a pipeline. So the, all the derivatives like uh, green ammonia, green methanol, green diesel and so on will come to Germany anyway. So that's why we are looking into things as well, but as a provider of green hydrogen from that point of view. And in general, I mean, do you observe um, the growing interest um, from investors for hydrogen technology that is really turning into firm commitments. I mean, I think everybody is sort of looking at it. Every kind of credible investor is looking at the issue. But are they confident um, enough to really put their money into the technology? Or are we still in this sort of we're not sure phase? To answer that, um, maybe one step back. I mean, the, 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 the technology, as Andrea said, concerning electrolyzers is 100 years proven, so there is not a big problem with that. But running these electrolyzers in a dynamic way, so following in a way the generation of renewables, is something new. And the effect that you are causing in, in operating them in a different way than, than you would do it um, beside a hydropower plant or a nuclear power plant gives an uncertainty. And, you know, money is very cautious and, and agreeing on, on, on how, how we should manage this uncertainty is, is a big thing that is keeping investors away. Um, we had very good discussions with our ministry in, in the last uh, two weeks. Um, they are ch uh, starting to catch, catch up and there is one, I think, um, idea that, that was transported from the branch to the ministry that is um, supporting these investments with, with um, guarantees, state guarantees, um, concerning the lifetime of the product. So if you have a certified product and you have statements from TÜV or other regular um, certifying units, then the state takes in a way the, the, the rest risk um, that the lifetime will not be as long as, as estimated maybe um, to facilitate these FIDs. And, and in the discussion with stakeholders, we found out that such an instrument um, would enable 80% of the outstanding FIDs. So this is a very important tool that we are waiting for. In, in our case, because we are doing the whole variability with batteries, um, 
we are much better off because we are running our electrolyzers much closer to the typical um, way to operate it. When we talk about structure, um, I mean, what's, what's your next structural move? I mean, you're focused on the two projects now. When we look like a year down the line, is, um, would you be open to the idea, let's say, of an initial public offering? Um, we see movement there in the market uh, around hydrogen players. How do you think about such a scenario? We are focusing at the moment more on the technical means, looking at the market, selling, producing, and then we will see how, how, how is the market. I think an IPO is definitely an interesting thing, especially if you need some money for further growth, because you know if that is really developing as we assume, there is a lot of capital necessary. Just the first phase is already in a range of uh, more than 100, 200, 300 million, depends how you build it. So that's not uh, not pity money. And uh, yeah, if you if you need that for growth and to finance our growth, why not? We will see. But it's not a priority to look at into these things ahead. Alexander, something to add? No, I think everything is said. I mean, the, the, in, we have two. We, have, we are seeing two sides. On the one side, it's infrastructure money that wants to see safe returns over a long period of time. So uh, the the, the um, fungibility of the of the of, of the asset is not a big issue. Um, but I think to to get the, um, the money that is needed for the transformation, um, you you will also um, have to address other capital markets, and therefore we will see how to move on. But it's too early to take um, 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 a conclusion on that. Final question: um, Do you see a risk that Germany is falling behind in the in the global energy transition? Um, maybe start with you, Alexander. No, I don't see that. Um, I don't see that as a competition. I, I see that in a way that um, many countries have taken up now the challenge to decarbonize. Um, the total volume of um, solar electrolyzers, of assets, is completely underestimated. So even if you see the big announcement in, in solar, I mean, China is moving up to 500 gigawatt production. Canada is starting with double digit gigawatts. United States is starting, India is starting 50 gigawatt. So normally, you, uh, if you compare that with the installed base that we have in Germany, which is 50 gigawatt, I mean, production are coming online that, are, that could supply all the, all the modules that we have installed in the last 20 years in six months. So you can add, think about an oversupply, that will not happen because the, the market will, will absorb all these technologies. We, we have to understand that in, in meanwhile, solar, is, solar and the value chain following is on the same price point than the fossil oil business. Last year, we had the first year where more money went into the new technology, renewable, than into the old. So I think we are, we are seeing interesting times, and uh, I think not that Germany is falling behind. I think that very important parts of the technology that the world needs will be invented here and will create also wealth in this country. Well, uh, let me add a different flavor to that. I don't believe we are falling behind. Yes, we could be faster, but I think we are already on a good track. Uh, so from the general approach, I would say, no, we are on, we're on a good track. We just have to push it through. On the other hand, I, am, I would say we have to be careful that we're not falling from one dependency into another. We have seen what energy dependency means, what it can do to a society uh, that can be weaponized and whatever. And we have seen what happens to the solar industry as we have done things in Germany and maybe a little bit different. It was invented here, it was subsidized here, and then it went to China. So we should be very careful that we keep our hands around core technology, about electrolyzers, batteries, uh, technology, and so on. We will not be energy in independent, uh, not in the next decades from my point of view, but I think we can make sure that we are not becoming dependent again from a different single source. Andreas, Alexander, thank you so much for taking the time and to talk to us on such a great variety of issues. We'll be watching HH2E's development with great interest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.